Well, thank you, Maria, and let me thank everyone uh, for coming this evening. Can I just say that the London School of Economics is tremendously proud of its Alumni Association uh, here in Greece. It is one of the largest, it's one of the most active, and it has a range of activities which it uh, supports. It has a committee which is highly committed, gives lots of energy. You just heard uh, its president, Maria Xitaki, and actually, Maria, I'd like you to come back on stage so I can give you a small gift from the LSE. scenes and she's uh, helped a lot uh, to make this evening a, a success so we're very grateful. Um, I'm very proud to be the director of the Hellenic Observatory at the London School of Economics and the Hellenic Observatory has an advisory board of which uh, there are several members uh, present uh, this evening from the advisory board and I'd like to thank I'd like to thank them for coming, but I'd also like to thank each of the members of the advisory board for their support and advice over the years. It is very much uh, appreciated. In fact, one of the members of the advisory board who's here this evening, uh, Athena Marco Michalaki, is not only a member of the advisory board, but also a member of the committee of the Hellenic Alumni Association. So she contributes in both ways, and I'd like to thank her for her contribution uh, as well. On behalf of uh, Dimitris Papa Dimitriou and myself, uh, let me say that we are truly honored uh, to have the presence of a number of senior public and political figures uh, here this evening. Uh, it's humbling that you've uh, come to join us uh, tonight. Uh, I won't um, name you uh, individually, uh, but let me say thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. We're also very grateful that tonight's lecture is uh, being live streamed and will be available as a podcast later. So. Uh, to what I hope is my son and daughter watching us at this very moment, I say welcome to everyone outside the room who's watching the lecture uh, tonight. As Maria has indicated, uh, tonight is the first lecture in a second year of public lectures, uh, which we've organized with the Megadon uh, Plus uh, here in Athens. And the LSE could hardly have a, mo a more prestigious, more attractive uh, location. And I'd like to thank the staff of the Megadon for their um, professionalism uh, and their commitment uh, to making this series uh, a success. In fact, can I ask you to join me in thanking in particular uh, two colleagues who've been enormously helpful, uh, Maria Andrianu and Irini Andriadi. Can you please join me in thanking them? <laughs> Finally, we're delighted that uh, Alexis Papahalas has uh, joined us on stage for uh, this evening's event. He will be acting as the discussant and moderating the questions, uh, the discussion uh, later on. Uh, can I mention this might be a timely point to say that uh, at this particular point in time, both Dimitris and I have enormous respect for Alexis Papahelas. I'll tell you whether the respect still holds at the end of the evening, but at the moment, he's a fantastic guy. <laughs> it's a joint lecture. Uh, it's a joint lecture this evening, of course, uh, because the book is jointly authored. So I'm going to start with an introduction. Uh, Dimitris Papa Dimitriou is then going to speak about some of the empirical parts of the book, some of the empirical material, and then I will come back and make some concluding uh, comments. Can I say it's, um, 
It's always a pleasure to collaborate with Dimitrius Papadimitriou. Uh, he started some years ago as my PhD student, and now he's a full professor in his own right, and deservedly of much respect. I've learned a lot from Dimitris, and our working partnership is very much one of equals, so I'm delighted to share the platform. So, our book deals with a big question. How can the Prime Minister establish an effective system for the control and coordination of the government in order to better achieve the goals that he or she has set? Beyond these tasks of control and coordination, we might also add the capacity to undertake strategic planning, policy evaluation, and impact assessments, as these are additional functions that we increasingly expect of effective organizations today. How well does the Prime Minister's office in Greece manage these particular tasks? Now, during the current uh, crisis, foreigners often ask the question, why doesn't Greece reform? Why doesn't Greece put its own house in order? There's an implicit assumption here, of course, that the crisis was Greece's own fault and that its recovery lies in its own hands. Let me put that to one side. It's not our focus here tonight. But our book does relate to the question of Greece's capacity to reform domestically, the institutional and the systemic conditions that affect the ability to initiate and implement reform. In that sense, our book is concerned with both the driver as well as the car, how the driver drives and how the car responds. For the crisis, of course, has created quite a road test for governments in Greece. Now, reform capacity, the ability to deliver reform, of course, has many dimensions to it. In a previous book, we examined Greece's record on structural reforms, pensions, privatization, and the labor market, the record of reforms before the crisis, and we considered the interactions uh, between successive governments, the trade unions, and the employers. It was a political economy approach, and we gave the book the title, The Limits of Europeanization. Despite the impetus from Europe, domestic reform was constrained in Greece, we argued, by a distorted system of corporatism, an embedded statism, and rent-seeking behavior. These constituted entry barriers to the European Union's agenda of economic liberalism. But in this book, of course, we turn the focus on the government machine itself, as itself a factor in determining the capacity for reform. And it quickly seemed to us that government in Greece is based on a paradox, a paradox that stems from the very top of government. In constitutional terms, a Greek prime minister is one of the most powerful heads of government to be found anywhere in Europe. But the ability of the prime minister and those around him to control and coordinate the government, let alone to strategically plan, assess and evaluate policy, is severely limited. In effect, the Greek prime minister risks becoming an emperor without clothes. The book analyzes a huge amount of empirical material. Our focus covers five prime ministers from 1974 to 2009, from the restoration of democracy up to the start of the Euro crisis. And as I've indicated, Dimitris will highlight our empirical findings in more detail a little later. But let me straight away emphasize what our central argument is. Despite the changes over time of personality, 
of political party and of programs. The ability of the Prime Minister and his staff to control and coordinate the government has remained very limited. The capacity to perform other central functions has been almost minimal. The position of the Prime Minister reflects these dysfunctionalities. Of course, there has been variation across cases. Different Prime Ministers have had relatively more or less staffing resources around them. And the approach of the Prime Ministers to managing their governments has varied significantly. But no Prime Minister, we argue, has brought about transformative or lasting change in the efficient and effective management of the government machine. Instead, it's been variations on a theme, and the theme has displayed a path dependency. So therefore, we're faced with the question of explaining the absence of substantive change. And our analysis is, both, is based on both institutional factors and cultural norms and habits. Of course, the turnover of personnel has been high, but the actual change is limited by these institutional and cultural constraints in how government operates. The institutional factors that undermine the control and coordination uh, will be familiar to an audience like this, but let me just briefly highlight some of the basic points. To us, it seems that a Greek Prime Minister sits at the very centre of a vast archipelago of separate ministries and public bodies of different legal types. Government in Athens is quite simply compartmentalized in silos. Coordination, therefore, across ministries is hugely problematic. This fragmentation is reinforced by the weakness of the cabinet system. Of course, when the full cabinet meets, it's often big news. Sometimes the prime minister might be televised addressing his full cabinet, rather like a medieval king and his court. Tellingly, the cabinet structure does not include an established system of interdepartmental or interministerial committees, for example, at the level of senior officials, as would be found in many other European systems. In short, what we're saying is that for the cabinet system in Greece, there is little that is embedded institutionally. So much depends on the preferences of the individual Prime Minister. And without an effective cabinet system and without efficient coordination, individual ministers enjoy too much space to develop their own political networks and perhaps clientelistic opportunities. Or they can simply resist implementing unpopular reforms. To this fragmentation, we can add the problem of legal confusion. The Greek notion of polynomy, that is of too many laws, nicely highlights the problems of the complexity and the contradiction between laws. Contradictory provisions can be hidden away in early legislation that bear unlikely titles. And government often lacks the knowledge and expertise to check these contradictions before passing new legislation. Indeed, much of the drafting of the new laws is contracted out to private law firms, which adds to the fragmentation. The turnover of political personnel, of course, creates a fundamental discontinuity. The system struggles to know what was done before, let alone to learn from it. Much has to be done ab initio, improvised. And that improvisation at the top contrasts, of course, with the rigidities of the bureaucracy below. A legal formalism exalts rule-based behavior to excess and undermines the efficiency and the adaptability of the government machine. The hierarchical procedures of the bureaucracy are paralleled, pa paralleled by everyone avoiding responsibility and almost every action 
requiring the signature of the Prime Minister. This, then, is a quick and somewhat crude sketch of the organizational structure and operation surrounding a Prime Minister. But we can go deeper than this to look at attitudes, behaviors, and expectations in their social and cultural setting. Personally, I think a social anthropology study of governments on the inside in Greece would be absolutely fascinating. For this would give us a better sense of the barriers to change and the strength of feeling behind the established ways of doing things, the established traditions of doing things. For the organizational and the cultural dimensions are interlinked. The Prime Minister and his staff are detached organizationally, but they also sustain social norms, mindsets, and assumptions of separation. And at the very core of this setting is the norm of personal trust. The Prime Minister and his staff traditionally display an absence of trust in the wider government machine, a lack of trust in the loyalty, the skills, and processes of the government bureaucracy. And it prompts an insularity and smallness around the Prime Minister's office. All this is actually rather reminiscent of some classic writings of Michel Crozier on French bureaucracy in the 1960s. He also talks of omnipotent formal power being undermined by the feelings of a lack of trust up and down the bureaucratic hierarchy. He also stressed the impersonal rules, the centralization, isolation, and circumvention in the bureauc bureaucratic system. Consider this quotation from one of our interviews. We asked one of the prime ministers, why did you have such a small staff? You never had more than 12 or 14 advisors. And this, despite, despite you accepting that there were major challenges in control and coordination. His response, I can't, see, I can't see more than 12 or 14 advisors in any one week. Why do you need to see them? How can I trust them if I can't see them? He answered. Well, I said, the head of IBM or Ford doesn't need to see his staff in order to trust them. Ah, this is Greece, Kevin, was the reply. If I had more than 14 advisors, everything I said would be in the newspapers the next day. Now, the exchange I found very fascinating because it reflected two truths, of course. But the important truth stemmed from the Greek setting. The Prime Minister was clearly correct. But it's a mindset that self-limits. It accepts a limit of control and coordination of the government machine. Another cultural trait in the way of doing politics in Greece, of course, has sometimes been that of clientelism. Clientelism places expectations on the leader to deliver. Institutions lack loyalty, political favors are a substitute. Similarly, a Greek prime minister might have a sizable staff on the payroll, but often many are deployed elsewhere, working for the political party with little to do with government and perhaps not stepping inside Maximou. Consider this second quote from one of our other interviews. It's a former minister talking of another prime minister. He said, as prime minister, he spent much of his time pursuing favors, respecti. He would often telephone a minister and ask for favors. He would even call my deputy and ask him to do such things behind my back without my knowledge. I wished he would focus on the bigger issues, but he couldn't leave his telephone alone. To him, politics meant doing favors. 
Now, clientelism, of course, can distract some, not all, and it certainly misallocates and undermines. We are not claiming that either of these descriptions are typical. That's not the point. But by its nature, clientelism links power and society. Political sociologists like Bo Rothstein calls this a social trap. It isn't government that has a separate culture or mode of operation. Government feeds on society and society feeds on government. In the classic phrase, mazita fagame. <laughs> now, our quick, anthology, our, our quick anthropology of government in Greece, therefore, has highlighted just two elements, two major social norms the importance of personal trust to leadership and its ramifications, but also the impact of clientelism on the wider workings of governments. And I've also mentioned another cultural element, the administrative culture and its rigid rule-based obsession. We could no doubt add other elements, but these at least for the time being is, illustrates the importance of looking at both the cultural dimension alongside the institutional. We are not making an argument of cultural essentialism. We are not saying that a prime minister's behavior is somehow being reduced to a social determinism. Instead, we're identifying a setting, a, a context that privileges certain norms and behavior. These are dispositions, tendencies, expectations, not rules. So what we describe in the book is a variation on a theme, the lack of substantive lasting change. And this is our crucial point. Though five prime ministers that we've looked at showed variation in how they arrange their offices, how they utilize the cabinet, etc., none of them produced an effective legacy in terms of the lasting change in the ability of Maximo to control and coordinate the government machine, let alone perform other functions we often associate with the centre of government. And in the book, we argue that this limited functionality has had consequences for the ability of Greece to initiate and implement serious policy reform, that is for the reform capacity of Greece. Now, I'm going, to I'm going to pause here. Let me pass over to my more attractive co-author, the which was Papa Dimitriou, so he can map for you uh, the differences between the five prime ministers in how they manage the governments, and I will return a little later. Dimitriou.